Okay. Welcome to this IFR colloquium on autonomous driving. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to this. We have an amazing panel. Uh, let me start out with a little bit of material to just introduce the topic to you, and then we will go to our main speaker. So let's see here. Um, so I'm very happy that that we have this uh, with Wolfram Burgart, but before um, I give the word to him, I want to give you a little bit of context. So autonomous driving and everybody, this is, this is hot. This is really, well, let me give you a little bit of context. This is the front page of Scientific America, 1918, where you know they said we will soon have autonomous driving cars. They will all be electrical. Now we are, you know, a hundred and three years later. So it, it takes a little bit of time to actually get to autonomous driving. And of course, you know, back then we had just seen sort of the revolution from horse carriages to real cars and we've sort of seen this amazing revolution and there's a lot of people that sort of say autonomous driving are right around the corner it will happen very soon well let's see so just to give you a little bit of context to the right you're seeing that 1916 at the time when this came out the speed of horse carriages in london was 17 miles an hour a hundred years later it's 12 miles an hour so the speed actually went down, not up. So you might have, you know, the smartest autonomous driving car in the world. It might not help you unless you figure out how to do this. So I'm looking forward to, to Wolfram talking about this. At the same time, sort of for autonomous driving cars, it all really sort of started back in the mid eighties. So this has been around for, for, for quite some time, for about 25 years. One of the first pioneers that really did this sort of on real roads was Ernest Dickmann's who 1986 drove on the German highways uh, from, from Munich to Odense in Denmark to, to my home country. Uh, and then um, we saw this at about the same time in the US, we had a big program with Ken Kelly that was called the Autonomous Land Vehicle Program, mainly sort of off-road for military. But of course, the place where we really saw this sort of beginning to, to, to take off was with the... Uh, I can, uh, so, so where, where we're basically seeing the, you know, the DAPA Urban Challenge uh, 2007, and suddenly it was possible, we saw a limited number of vehicles that were really doing this, and only based on this uh, did we see the excitement, we saw Waymo, we saw all of these different companies coming up, which is very exciting. So this is sort of where we came from. It took us 13 years from there to get to where we are today. So I'm very happy for, for this to talk sort of about autonomous driving that our speaker is Wolfram Borgart, but as is always true for these uh, colloquiums, we have a front row that will sort of discuss this with the speaker. We have Marcel Ang from the National University of Singapore, who is sort of very much in charge of the many initiatives in, in, in Singapore. We have Andrea Sensi from ETH Zurich, who's very much involved in their programs that sort of happened both there and at MIT and also with the relationship to Singapore. Uh, I think we have Evangelist Teodoro, he just joined us. Uh, and Evangelist is a professor at Georgia Tech uh, where he studies sort of control uh, systems and sort of extreme dynamics. Uh, and finally, our student representative today is David Pass. David is normally our student producer for this, but today he's getting a front row and you can see sort of on his, on his background, he does autonomous driving as well. So um, the main speaker today is Wolfram. I've known Wolfram since he was a PhD student actually, uh, back in Bonn, uh, where they did sort of a lot of these experiments. And back then, of course, they started very much sort of the probabilistic gang and that written sort of the, the book on probabilistic robotics with Dieter Fox and Sebastian Trun. Uh, then he became a professor at Alfred Ludwig University in Freiburg. He's still a professor at Alfred Ludwig University in Freiburg. We don't know how long, but, you know, still. Uh, and uh, where he runs the intelligence systems and done some amazing work. He's won quite a number of different awards for his work. He is at present at the Toyota Research Institute, where he's the vice president for machine learning and for autonomous driving. He's also the past president of IEEE. Uh, robotics and automation society. So Wolfram has done it all. He's given to society. He's an amazing teacher and he's a fantastic researcher. 
So I'm very happy to hand it over to Wolfram and say, Wolfram, uh, it's all yours uh, as soon as I stop sharing here. Thanks. So you should now be able to um, do the, the right thing. Um, at the same time, uh, the, the link to, yeah, it's all yours. Um, the, uh, and if you have questions for the discussion afterwards, you can, I'm putting up in chat a link to Slido where you can post your questions uh, to everybody. But please, Wolfram, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great honor to be here. Thank you, Henrik, for this kind introduction and putting the bar so high. So uh, let's see as to whether I can pass it. Um, so it's my pleasure today to talk here about uh, probabilistic and machine learning approaches to automated driving. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, that, what we are doing at TRI in that direction, Toyota Research Institute. And um, and also where we see or how we see we can actually solve this problem and uh, what the difficulties are and the challenges for in doing this. So a few words in the beginning about uh, TRI, a second. Um, the um, few facts, so TRI was established in 2016 at the beginning of the year. It has over 300 uh, employees. We have basically three places we work in, which is uh, in the Silicon Valley, in Los Altos, in um, an arbor and in Cambridge, and we work closely with uh, famous universities like Stanford, Michigan, and uh, MIT. At the same time, we collaborate tightly with other uh, institutes uh, in the Toyota landscape, like to Toyota AI Ventures, Woven Planet, Toyota Connected, and others. Um, the major focus areas of TRI are, first of all, it's where the, the largest group is in is automated driving. And uh, then we have a large uh, robotics group as well. We also work on material research uh, and uh, accelerated materials design and discovery. And then we also have a group working on machine assisted cognition. And today I'm going to focus on uh, the automated driving space and that's what we are doing uh, in this area. Um, to, to begin with a few perspectives, uh, why it is so hard to build uh, autonomous cars and why it actually took us more than a hundred years to uh, still not be done with it entirely. Um, and uh, just to give you a few ideas uh, about the challenges and they are basically technological um, and then, but there are also others and I will talk about in this talk mostly about uh, the technological challenges, but economic employment, ethical, legal security and also with respect to energy. And the technical challenges are like, um, like it's very, very high. There are these human factors that we actually need to take into account um, understanding humans and making predictions about human behaviors. We have challenging situations uh, like left turn across traffic or um, like dynamic environments that we deal uh, with like changes to road surface and markings, interacting with people. And this year is a policeman uh, no notifying the driver that it actually is supposed to stop in order to let people uh, cross the road. And something like that needs to be understand, understood by an uh, automated vehicle. And then at the same time, we need to be able to maintain maps even under, uh, after changes. And we have to deal with uh, different weather conditions that might completely uh, change the way the environment looks like. Um, on the contrary, there's like an enormous amount of sensors that we uh, throw at these problems. And here you can see a little bit into the enclosure of the TR latest TRI car with a, a series of uh, cameras and lidars that we use to actually get 360 um, view of the of the environment of the surroundings of the vehicle in order to make optimal inferences. So here's a little bit of a history of the TRI cars, and uh, you can also see the um, the development of these these vehicles from the the pure shape of the vehicle. So 2016 we had Platform One, then in 2017 Platform Two. And uh, with platform three in 2018, you see actually a more integration and uh, getting rid of, uh, of the, 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 the crown sensor here on top of the vehicle. And uh, finally, this is the uh, 2019 vehicle, also la our latest version, where with a, the super high integration of the individual sensors, this is basically the enclosure that you saw in a little bit more detail 
just before, and it has plenty of sensors, uh, several skirt sensors, lidars, radars, and so on and so forth. So uh, Henrik already spoke about this, how hard it might be to build uh, a self-driving car. And here is an interesting uh, consideration that um, Edwin Olsen, uh, one of our colleagues now working for a self-driving car company uh, in for creating these type of buses that you see here, autonomous buses that you see on the top right. Um, like, and he gave a speech two years ago and uh, talked about like how long it's going to take to develop self-driving cars. And uh, to just to give you an idea about um, that the, his argument, which is basically Moore's law for self-driving. So what you see here is a, is a plot where you basically can see the typical performance of a, a human driver, which would be the miles between disengagement or the miles between fatal, uh, fatal errors, which would be 10 to the power of eight. Which, which means that in order to build an autonomous car that is competitive, uh, we need to reach this disengagement rate level. Right? So um, and this is an exponential scale here, or logarithmic scale. And uh, if we assume that uh, in nowadays developments, um, we can actually double the miles between interventions every year or every 16 months, uh, let's could it, call it that way, then uh, this would be the plot. So the log of that would be a linear function. And the question is when, when is the intersection? Right? So when, given the current rates, if we extrapolate this linearly in this log plot here, so when do we actually get to that intersection? And we do the calculation carefully, then uh, it will take 16 years and we started in 2019. So we will reach self-driving in 2035 which means there is still some time to go. Uh, and it basically also assumes that we will keep up the pace in terms of miles between intervention. Um, how are we going to do this, trying to do this at TRI? What is our approach to, to solving this? And uh, TRI actually differs itself in a certain way from uh, how other companies like the big players in the space are doing this. So what most of the companies are working on is a so-called chauffeur application which is a fully autonomous uh, driving system that is engaged at all times. And that, with that, they address applications like uh, automated taxi driving uh, services, so mo mobility as a service, basically. Um, at TRI, we are looking at an additional mode and not only to, not only to actually um, look at the self-driving aspect of it, but also at a at so-called driver assistance systems, the so-called guardian system. Uh, we also call this the uncrashable car or the car that will never be involved in an accident in which the driver is typically always engaged and the moni vehicle monitors and uh, steps in, in in cases where um, like dangerous situations arise. So this is basically uh, are the two modes that we are considering and we are developing this based on this one, uh, one vehicle. The idea there is that both applications uh, basically share a large amount of, um, of, of technology, basically perception, prediction, and planning will stay more or less the same. Um, there's additional aspects in the Guardian, like for example, you need to monitor the user and try to understand the user intent. Uh, but the majority of the, of the problems to be solved are basically identical. And uh, why we are doing this is something that I'm gonna explain in a, in a few seconds. But uh, for now, or in more detail, but in order to let you understand this a little bit more, uh, here's a short six minute long video from uh, CS 2019, where um, Gil Pratt basically explains the idea of uh, Guardian. Gil Pratt is our CEO.
Please welcome CEO, Toyota Research Institute, Gil Pratt. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. And thank you to Bob Carter for that perfect lead-in to what I think you will all believe was a rather vivid opening statement. The three-car crash that you saw actually happened just as you saw it. We know this because we were there using an array of sensors and cameras. Our engineers at Toyota Research Institute captured a robust and diverse set of data to recreate what happened that day last summer. Our Lexus test vehicle was traveling in the leftmost lane in manual mode. The autonomy was disabled, but the perception system was fully active. It was mapping and gathering data at the many tunnels and bridges in the Bay Area. And luckily, despite the severity of the crash, no one was injured. We show you this now not to wow you with technology, but because I want to take you through a question that we posed to ourselves that very day. So here's the question. Could a future Toyota Guardian have prevented or mitigated the crash that you just saw? We believe that the answer is yes. So let me talk to you a little bit about what Toyota Guardian is all about. The essence of Toyota Guardian is about amplifying rather than replacing human ability. It's like giving dad his car keys back for a bit more time behind the wheel. Or even more importantly, it's about saving teenage lives where car crashes account for 30% of fatalities. It's about correcting for human mistakes and for human weaknesses and assisting the most vulnerable people at both ends of the age spectrum where far too many lives are lost. Now, from the beginning, TRI has been committed to a two-track approach to automated driving, simultaneously developing Toyota Guardian while working on level four and level five self-driving systems that we call Toyota Chauffeur. Now, Chauffeur is the kind of self-driving technology that all of you hear about in the press all of the time. Specifically, it's an approach that replaces the human driver with AI, with a machine. Level five chauffeur is defined as a system that's capable of driving anywhere, anytime, in any conditions with no driver input. And that's a wonderful goal. Someday we may achieve it. But it's really essential to not underestimate how hard a task chauffeur systems are, both technologically and also sociologically in many ways. For example, how do we train a machine about the social ballet required to navigate through an ever-changing environment, as well as, or better than, a human driver? How do we teach the systems to predict what a policeman means when they motion to you to stop at an intersection even though the light is still green? Or when a pedestrian will decide to cross the road? These are hard questions. Let's also keep in mind that it may take considerable time for society to accept the inevitable crashes, the inevitable injuries, and the inevitable fatalities that are still going to happen with chauffeur systems. Now, none of us, none of us in the automobile or IT industries are close to fully answering these questions. In the meantime, we all have a moral obligation to apply automated vehicle technology to save as many lives as possible, as soon as possible. On closed courses, Guardian's intelligence and capabilities can be stretched and challenged through continuous refinement. Our Guardian systems learn how to best navigate and react to dangerous scenarios as they unfold. For example, in the demonstration that you see here, a vehicle suddenly pops out from behind a row of parked cars too quickly for any car to simply break in its lane. Sensing that the next lane is clear, but only for a brief window, our guardian alerts the driver, visually and audibly, of the imminent danger, and then avoids the pop-out car by maneuvering out of the lane briefly, and then quickly returning to the original lane to avoid the obstruction ahead. Now, this growing guardian capability gives the I-80 incident that I opened with today that vivid crash that you saw, an interesting lemons to lemonade twist. 
Here was an accidental corner case on a public highway. A dangerous three-car encounter that unfolded right before our eyes. From the data that we gathered, we first developed an accurate simulation, which we then translated into a learning tool for Guardian to perceive, to predict, and to plan the options that it had in a split second. We then recreated that same scenario on the test track using real vehicles and a guarded, guided, excuse me, soft target dummy vehicle. In this instance, Guardian's best option was to safely accelerate away from encroaching vehicles to avoid a collision. And furthermore, by accelerating out of the way, Guardian did this other thing, which was to help make space that might have prevented the other vehicles from crashing as well. In this... Okay, thank you. Um, so, so this is basically the idea of Guardian. And um, the, what we still have to do in both contexts is to basically have autonomous cars that perceive their environment and generate controls to allow them to safely reach their goal. And uh, we do have the exact same problems that we do have in robotics as well. We have, we perceive our environments, we create internal models and update them about the environment and of the, the state of the vehicle itself, uh, and then act uh, in order to actually potentially modify the environment, at least the state of the vehicle itself. And uh, the three main uh, aspects that we are targeting with NTRI is if we don't leave the road, don't get hit, and don't hit anything. And if we accomplish that, then we are going to end up having a safe car that uh, fulfills the, the guardian and also the chauffeur requirements. And we all know that uh, there's no such thing as perfect sensors and actuators. And uh, that's something that we are actually working on with NTRI and uh, try, uh, trying to approach uh, or trying to deal with in order to solve the overall problem. Um, so the key components like of a, a self-driving car are to, or that you find in most vehicles are depicted over here. You basically you have your vehicle that with the sensors and you have a component for mapping, creating maps, and uh, you have a perception module interpreting the world, um, feeding into mapping as well, and into localization. And together with map, you get then uh, the map, you get an accurate localization estimates. Prediction is the, the tool for predicting what is going on in the world or going to be going on in the world. And then you have a planning approach that reacts to these predictions and that the current state in order to issue controls that are then fed into the car. And uh, in this talk, I will mostly uh, focus on mapping, perception, localization, and briefly also uh, the map, uh, the maps that we are using. And, and uh, this is the agenda for today, the individual topics I'm going to cover. And with, here with that, I'm going to do my first break and uh, let uh, the panel step in and uh, ask the first questions or give the first comments. Who wants to go first on the panel? Don't be shy. Maybe I can go first. Yes. Um, so what from, I think in two slides ago, you mentioned what would be the goal of a safe system, or I guess the definition of a safe system. Um, and you mentioned uh, don't eat the road, don't leave the road, don't eat anything, don't get hit. Um, so I have two questions. One is that, uh, you know, it's very hard to guarantee that you don't get hit because that doesn't depend just on you. Yeah. Um, the second comment is that uh, um, I believe that uh, in some cases it would be fine to leave the road, right? So leaving the road is not essentially like intrinsically a bad thing. Right? It depends on the situation. Yeah. So maybe you have a, you can say a little bit more about qualifying those constraints. Yeah, that's true. I mean, this is a little bit uh, conservative uh, that uh, that the phrase that we have here. Even when we think about modern driver assistance systems, uh, for example, these um, lane departure alerts, they are rarely used simply because people sometimes take shortcuts and go over the the line, the lanes on the on the road or the line painted lines. And then they get alerts from these these uh, driver assistance systems, and which is why they don't use them. So I think you're right, and that is definitely an alternative option. To I mean, um, in this video that you saw, the car accelerated away as the optimal action, and uh, 
you could also imagine a situation where the car actually actually uh, safely leaves the road and uh, maybe go runs into a field in order to avoid a severe accident. Uh, you are absolutely right. More from the panel. Yes, David? I have a. I have a comment um, or, or a question too. I like uh, Wolfram and everybody's views too. Regarding the guardian, uh, what happens if the human driver decides to take over because thinks that the guardian made a mistake? Uh, how will that happen? Uh, and uh, humans may not be able to quickly take over too. And how is the conflict resolved? Yeah, I mean, uh, th th those are things you're also thinking about. Uh, I mean, you can always, and you should always be able to disengage a system. You know, there should always be a disengagement opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, and th this, is, this is something that, um, that is also very, very critical, um, the guardian should virtually never fail. Right? Whenever mm -hmm. guardian steps in, it should be absolutely certain that it is going to be able to safely execute uh, in that particular situation. Okay, thank you. That is that is a challenge. You know, the, the that's basically the you want to minimize the the false positives. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the for number of false positives needs to be zero in that case. So. Right. Or uh, another uh, maybe possible view is to the actions that the guardian can actively take can be sort of uh, semi active or passive. Right. It it should just break or rather than change directions or something yeah. like that. Or, and that is what is going on in nowadays, uh, assistance systems like the automatic brake systems. Right, um, right. You know, they just decelerate, but they don't change direction and they, they are not able to accelerate away. Yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. Well, from one, another question, do you think it's easier to make a chauffeur or to make a guardian? Because it seems like the chauffeur has a simpler problem to solve. Because yeah. that's not human to deal with. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. I mean, you have to also have to deal with other uh, drivers and in, in the road and pedestrians and so on and so forth. Um, that's a little bit the topic of that talk. And uh, uh, my argument is going to be that by working on chauffeur, by on guardian, you're going to accelerate the uh, the development of chauffeur. So I have a follow-up question if time permits. Uh, so it's in regards to the disengagement data uh, that's essentially openly and publicly available. Uh, for instance, the California DMV publishes uh, uh, information from all the companies currently doing testing here. Um, but the question in regards is about the data itself. And there isn't a clear distinction on whether you know, this was highway miles or urban environment miles. Uh, where does it split fit into the model for the prediction for 2035, becoming the year where you know, we'll have autonomous driving? Could this be partially influenced or is this a good estimate on your opinion? I mean, um, I mean, you can always, and this is something that everyone knows, uh, tweak these numbers by driving up and down Highway 101 you know, in, in the valley. So that's an easy way to, to and then you can also drive more on Sunday mornings, you know, so the, uh, and the outside of the, the peak traffic hours and also depends on where you are. Um, and I think we all should be just honest as scientists and, uh, and report the correct numbers and then um, we can see where that goes. All right, so I suppose that the last follow-up question is about 2035 itself. It's 16 years, right? So it's gonna be taking a little while from now. Uh, so we get there. Uh, so do you think it's, there's a possibility that we'll actually hit a, uh, another AI winter before then? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. So uh, um, I think, and we, we, I think we should come back to that question after, at the end of my talk, uh, because uh, I'm, I, I'm trying to lay out a pathway towards that and avoiding that AI winter. So, Wolfram, so we have uh, we sh we should let you get on with your talk. But before we do that, so so one of the questions from the audience is, if the guardian system is similar to shared autonomy, what is the degree of autonomy here? How do you define sort of the degree of autonomy? Is does it still make sense to do one to five or? 
what's a reasonable way of thinking about this? Yeah, that, that, that's also a very good question. Um, so we think as this as a level four system uh, that is that only needs to be engaged in short time periods. Uh, we, uh, it's only for, let's say, 10, 15 seconds of autonomy. Uh, and uh, it can take over. That is something that we haven't uh, fully understood yet as well, like as to whether there is in, in which way we can realize this shared autonomy. So what does it mean? So can we just, I mean, you basically have two controls. You have like the, the lateral control, like steering wheel, and you have the accelerations uh, or decelerations. There are your, the two controls that you can issue. And the question is like, how, can you, you can definitely separate those, uh, but um, how do you basically do this? And uh, in, in particular also, in this communication with the user. So this entire inform, warn, execute uh, cycle that uh, you know, Pratt mentioned there is something that actually uh, we haven't like fully developed right now and fully understood how that might work. And that requires definitely also some research. But in parts, you can definitely, uh, like in, for specific applications, it might be relatively easy. In the interest of time, Wolfram, I think you should uh, do part two. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. Um, so um, what I'm going to talk about like, briefly is probabilistic robotics, because from my perspective, um, automated driving or driving vehicles can uh, be realized only if two ingredients are present. And uh, one is like state estimation and control, like the classical robotics. Uh, stuff that we were working on up to, let's say, five years ago. And then like, the second one is to actually increase the robustness and achieve that, uh, achieve the desired robustness. The only way to solve this, uh, to achieve that is basically machine learning to, to uh, perform the, or to create the, the necessary robustness in perception. Um, so I will talk briefly about probabilistic robotics um, and um, what we are doing there and what is, um, and what are the basis for this? For those who don't know this, um, like probabilistic robotics is basically state estimation, like trying to estimate a probabilistic belief given all the observations and actions. And here's an implementation using the so-called uh, Bayesian recursive Bayesian updating rule. And action generating generation is then the sort of utility optimization or cost function optimization here in equation from uh, operations research or reinforcement learning. Uh, where you basically take into account uncertainties as well in order to derive optimal decisions. The key problem there is dealing with this uncertainty and uh, for perception, one of the um, best approaches right now is so-called so particle filter. This is actually one of the famous approaches here where you represent your belief by a set of hypotheses and then like make predictions about where the, the vehicle might end up given that what you measure from your wheel sensors uh, or your IMU. And then at the same time, after that, you basically do some survival of the fittest, uh, realize a survival of the fittest scheme where you evaluate every hypothesis according to the likelihood of the observation given its state. So hypotheses in the right spot get rewarded with a higher signal than a hypothesis with, uh, uh, which are in the wrong spot. And then you do a resampling operation, you let hypotheses survive proportional to their importance weight or fitness value. And uh, here is one uh, application of this, uh, where you basically see the robot performing that what we call global localization. These red dots are 10,000 hypotheses. The blue rays are the ultrasound measurements and the gray, um, uh, grayish things are the obstacles the robot knows about, why the free space, and based on this, the robot can actually accurately figure out where it is. And this is a very, very popular approach for, um, for localization. So solving basically that problem of uh, don't leave the road, right? Or where am I on the road? And uh, you cannot only, um, so the key question then is always like, how do you get these maps for these, uh, for these localization tasks? And uh, that is the process of simultaneous localization and mapping, one of the most active areas uh, in robotics for a long, long time. And uh, so here's a typical example of a, a data set um, where a robot drove around and collected um, 
odometry data and laser data, which are the black spots that you see scattered around. And the key task now is to reconstruct, reconstruct what the environment looks like given, um, in, given all this data. And um, there has been a tremendous amount of, of work in this area. And here in this panel are also famous com contributors uh, to these problems. And basically the most popular approaches in this context are uh, particle filters, again, um, that can be used for, for this purpose where now every, every hypothesis not only carries a pose of the vehicle, but also a map. Um, and these particles, again, survive proportional how well their uh, measurements fit given their own map. Right? So consistent maps have a higher likelihood of surviving than others. And um, here's an application example for the very same data set that you saw before. And uh, you see all these hypotheses spreading out and um, the, the robot actually estimating uh, the map of, uh, of that environment. And uh, this is one of the, the, the popular approaches uh, in this context. Um, it, is, um, it is very efficient. Um, this is why people have been using it and it can be used online on the vehicle, um, which makes it very attractive. The problem is that it is not an optimization approach and sometimes because of the hypotheses guessing where the robot might be, uh, it has uh, leaves you with some inconsistencies like this double wall down here. Sometimes it even also fails in fact, but uh, even when you converge or when, when it, if you post it, the entire data set, then you sometimes have slight inconsistencies, which made people look more into the so-called uh, optimization of based approaches that uh, actually then try to resolve such um, uh, in, inaccuracies in, in the map and actually correspond more to a maximum likelihood uh, approach. And this is called graph slam. And graph slam basically does the very same thing as uh, we saw before, but only within, within an optimization framework. So again, you, re you record the data set, um, right? Which, and this is a production hall in, in a factory. And uh, what you see here in black are, is the trajectory on one hand, and on the other hand, so-called um, data associations, which basically tell you that um, this place over here is the very same as this place over there. And um, that then framed as a so-called constraint problem, uh, which basically says there is a force that drags this position over here, over there. And uh, these are all data associations that you see all these cross links between the trajectories. And then you have the, the trajectory itself, plus these uh, observation of, uh, let, it call, let us call this landmarks or uh, poses uh, where we get additional uh, links in that graph. And you can now consider this as something like a mass spring system where the, the data associations are springs and also the movements are springs and the individual poses are masses. And what you now do is you uh, like throw this mass spring system into a bath of oil and uh, the nice, um, characteristic of these mass spring systems is that they converge to a minimum energy configuration, not the minimum energy con configuration, but one. So ideally, uh, so this is our mass spring system. We throw it into a bath of oil, let it converge, and then ideally it converges to the optimal solution, and then you can re-render the map uh, based on this. And with this, yeah, there's a mathematical formulation as well. Andrea Chancy will in particular like this because it is least squares optimization and uh, where you basically um, take the look at the observation errors, basically the error, the difference between your predicted pose from the observed pose. And this is a covariance over here that actually helps you to weigh these inter individual errors. And then that also all uh, turns out to be a nice optimization problem. I mean, you then have to invert late large matrices and uh, there's specific tools for, for doing this, and then you can end up uh, having a nice math mathematical formulation of uh, the so-called uh, so SLAM problem that leads to optimal uh, uh, maps then in the end, ideally. And uh, here is an application, um, some uh, prior work done uh, by uh, Kurt Knowledge and uh, one of my team members, where this approach is shown to be able to do this in an online fashion. Uh, so whenever you actually see the robot correcting the maps, whenever it performs so-called loop closures or data associations. And these systems are enormously efficient. You can also do this in the batch mode like here, but you can also go wild and uh, initialize all the poses with uh, 
a random rotation and zero, zero in the very beginning. And uh, in this case, it even is able to unfold the map uh, from this more or less um, uh, random uh, initialization. And it, it in fact also works in 3D. And this is the, the Freiburg campus, uh, like an indoor outdoor map uh, recorded with a sensor head and uh, a quadrotor that we used to actually fly over the Freiburg campus and uh, yeah, can get highly accurate maps for that purpose that are then used uh, in automated vehicles nowadays. And uh, for, for driving, there's different approaches. Like this is uh, called a, a dense 3D map. It's something that some of the companies are using. Other companies are looking more into sparser representations, so-called HD maps. This is also something that we favor at TRI, um, where we basically take LiDAR and camera-based information into account and create a big optimization problem out of this. We do have actually an infrastructure to um, do this on a very large scale, so on an Earth scale, uh, in, in, to, perform, to store these maps retrieve them and also perform optimizations in, on that scale. And um, here is um, some like um, footage of uh, like the, the, the maps that we are uh, learning from vision data, for example. And on the right hand side, you see a simulation of our vehicle uh, in these maps uh, with also some uh, semantic um, um, segmentation, which I'm gonna speak later about. Yeah, and with that, um, I'm uh, going to stop here again and um, ask the panel to further drill holes into me. Yeah. Panel questions? Yeah, I guess uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, so uh, the question I have is, uh, I guess, uh, in some sense uh, academic but it has also i guess the uh, application aspect um in a lot of these localization tasks vehicles are moving in a very canonical way like uh out so uh, outside of their uh limits of their performance uh, uh what's your opinion in terms of uh, um of uh the degradation, if there exists any degradation in performance in these SLAM algorithms when uh, uh, the vehicle is operating into dynamic limits? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a very important question. Um, this is something that you can look at into, from, look at from different angles. So first of all, you wanna know this uh, on the fly, you know, as to whether you, you might be in a situation where um, the vehicle believes to be somewhere where it actually currently uh, is not, you know? And there's different ways uh, for doing this. You know, you can look at, when, when you think about particle filters or the more, where you have a more explicit representation of the belief uh, about uncertainties, you can also look at uh, likelihoods of your observations in order to, order to monitor this. This is something that uh, you definitely can do. You can even learn, uh, try to throw a machine learning approach at it that actually looks at certain features of distributions uh, or perceptions in order to identify as to whether localization might be wrong. Um, and then uh, on top of that, you typically do some sort of uh, um, offline um, evaluation. So whenever the vehicle comes back, you can run actually like very, very complex algorithms on that. Uh, or maybe even an anti-slam algorithm, or you can run this with like way more particles uh, in order to figure out as to whether localization was wrong, spot, spot an area, and then uh, look at the reasons for this and uh, try to mitigate these problems. David? Uh, yeah, so I have a follow-up question uh, that's kind of related to uh, the, the dynamic aspects of driving whether maps considerably change over time. Uh, so for globally consistent maps, does it make sense to also invest in infrastructure, uh, such as placing sensors in different urban or areas where you know, the vehicles actually intend to drive uh, and whether this would actually be cost effective at a large scale, yeah. uh, given that we're you know, keeping uh, these maps uh, probably up to date if there's construction might be a relevance. Yeah. yeah, that's also a good question. Um, the, 
the problem with that is that it might be enormously expensive to actually modify the infrastructure and uh, that it doesn't it's it's going to be impossible to to actually do this um our approach towards this is actually and you will see this in a, in a third part of this presentation to look at uh, at, at guardian and basically uh, learn from guardian and have the ability to potentially even drive without maps and there are competitors who are, who try to do this uh, and uh, so that would be one solution and uh, I think it's also a very promising direct research direction, actually looking at this problem of being able to navigate without having to build a map a priori. Right. I think that makes sense. Thanks. So, Wolfram, one of the questions that came in from the audience is <clears throat> for, for the SLAM, if you now have a very noisy set of sensors, how do you deal with inconsistencies and things like that in your, in your sensor fusion? that's also that's a very important question um i think um, that's my personal opinion and that is uh, the only way to 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 deal with very noisy sensors is to go there more often and collect more data and uh, that's basically the essence of the the entire probabilistic approach that uh, i mean in information never hurts which means that uh, it's in the end you're going to be like arrive at the very same information the only problem that you need to be taken care of is dependencies between consecutive measurements and so not having any biases in there so being overly confident and uh, on top of that uh, it might be the case that uh, the, the uncertainty that you introduce by driving around that uh, it will actually not be also will be higher than the, the information that you gather from the sensors and if that is the case then there's nothing you can do other than uh, driving in smaller circles. Okay. I think um, we still have room for some discussion at the end. So, but, but I think in the interest of time, we should probably let you go on with the yeah. uh, third part of your talk. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, so in the last part, I'm going to talk about uh, the machine learning approach and uh, that answers then several of these questions regarding regarding guardian and chauffeur how we are going to do this and uh, how we think or what we think is the right approach to arrive at fully autonomous cars uh, in the long run and um, so if you look at the history of or the approaches to to automated driving then you basically can see um, like one that is the so-called software engineer approach um, that is the, the, the idea of, okay, let's simply program everything. You know? um, we have seen that maps need to be learned. It's hard to program a map, um, but um, it's basically meaning that, that we do everything manually. Right? Uh, definitely that might be possible, but it will be very, very expensive because you need a lot of uh, people uh, programming the stuff and maybe tuning things. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, is a, they have been called as a so-called scientist. Um, it's a little bit of self-irony, but uh, so it's basically the idea of like learn everything, right? Uh, so the question there is uh, like, how can we, could we, can we do this? Like you definitely do, do not want to put a car out in, into the real world and let it learn there by trial and error. And um, so the only alternative to this is having high fidelity simulators, um, but then you still have this sim to real gap and also um, the, the question of, uh, do you actually have sufficiently um, elaborated agents in simulation that allow you to um, generate all these corner cases that you need to build autonomous cars? The next, the, of course, idea would be the, that would be the machine learning engineering approach. Let's just label everything. And, um, and then um, we let the vehicle learn from these, that learned upon these labeled data. And the key question is where do the labels come from? And here is an actual data set recorded in, uh, in Japan or Daiwa, uh, close to Tokyo, um, with, um, with scenes recorded from our vehicles. And uh, as you can imagine, like labeling every single frame here and telling what every data point is, uh, is extremely uh, co uh, expensive. And, um, and if you consider this, um, uh, the necessity of doing this for 
a huge amount of, of data, then it often obviously doesn't scale. So the question now is like, how can we do this and how can, can we solve this problem? And here uh, is actually that what we think where GRI had, has a comparative advantage, uh, namely the ability to basically learn from everyone. And uh, how we, are we going to do this? So just to put that uh, or take, tell you that what is on the next slide is, Toyota is a company that has millions of cars in the real world of, uh, already. And every of these cars has, uh, or at least the future cars, will have plenty of sensors. And the key idea is to basically use that, these type of sensors to, that are in the car right now to learn from the data so that we can build better vehicles, guardians, and chauffeurs in the future. Right? We call this the, the Toyota strategic data advantage. Right, So we will get basically data in the amount that is like uh, larger than like all the road kilometers in the US per day. So this is an um, unbelievably large amount of, of data. And uh, obviously it's gonna be impossible to, to, to label everything. Um, so we need to actually have the ability to deal with unlabeled data and minimum amount of supervision. This is why we are looking into <clears throat> this problem of supervised and self-supervised learning from uh, large volumes of structured and unlabeled data. And, and this is the, the key idea that uh, we are um, working on here or the key uh, problem that we are working on here. And I will briefly talk about, and I'm probably not going to be able to talk about all of them, but uh, a, a few of these um, aspects that we are working on, probably the, the first two ones, uh, and then at the end talk a little bit about something that you additionally need when uh, you leave academia and you go to industry and do this really at a large scale, namely a proper machine learning infrastructure. So uh, the first one is that what we call uh, mono depth, uh, the paper is called uh, super depth, uh, arrived at, it was published in, at ICRA in 2019. There's a few uh, follow up papers about this as well. And I will talk about two in that line of research. So the idea of this work is to basically um, replace the LIDAR in the long run, uh, get rid of the LIDAR and uh, just being able to do what the LIDAR does with a monocular camera, uh, basically, and, and do this in a, in a way that it is self-supervised or even uh, unsupervised right, in the long run. So what is a monocular depth estimation is basically calculating a depth value for every pixel in your image. And, uh, this is what is called uh, a mono depth uh, network. That's what we want to arrive at. How can we do this or how, how can one do this? So first of all, speaking briefly about the supervised learning approach, usually what you do there is um, you take the raw data, you have your model, um, let it generate predictions, and then you calculate a loss based on target uh, values or labels uh, associated to the raw data that you're having, right? So, and the data, while well, this is easy to acquire, like labels are extremely difficult and expensive uh, to acquire. So we need to find a way to do this in a uh, self-supervised or even unsupervised way. All right, so th this is the self-supervised approach. And how can we do this in the context of, um, of this problem of, uh, of depth estimation from molecular images? So what we do for the first time, the first work that we, work, that we realized, we basically took a stereo system uh, where we took the images from the left and the right camera. Took the for the images from the left camera, we made a, a depth prediction using our mono depth uh, network. Um, oh, give me a second. Uh, here we go. And then we perform a so-called view synthesis by basically taking into account the depth uh, and given the baseline and the depth, we then can actually calculate and the left hand side image. Right? We can basically calculate what the right-hand side image would look like um, given the disparity and the depth and the left image. And um, so in that taking, comparing this to the right-hand side image provides us with a proxy loss that we can then use to actually train this mono depth network. Right? And here's a little bit of information about the loss function where we basically take into account the photometric loss, uh, pixel differences, where we have a depth regularization uh, at edges and then also uh, dealing with uh, occlusions there. And um, the interesting aspect here that we also did 
like some optimizations there where we basically in the view synthesis um, synthesized at higher higher resolutions in the original images, which um, actually we found out in substantially increases the accuracy and you can see these growth, growth curves over here still. Right? And what you can see is that our system basically outperforms the, the state of the art at that time. Um, so the best performance we got with um, these sub convolution that I just mentioned, plus uh, that what we call flip augmentation, uh, which is basically just flipping the images and uh, in this way getting additional uh, Data for uh, data for learning, and here's a few um, results, uh, qualitative uh, results on the the mono depth uh, network. So what is pretty amazing is that the system can even like get like thin poles over here um, and all these kind of fine structures, and it's very very good at, at the construction of those. Basically, also for a slam person like me, it is also interesting that. Uh, with these type, once you have the depth, you can actually run a SLAM uh, process on, on the so-called reconstructed uh, LIDAR scans. And then you get, can compare the, uh, the trajectory, the reconstructed trajectory to the, to the ground truth trajectory. And the similarity that you see here indicates the accuracy of the overall process. Here's a few videos, oh, sorry, uh, it's an auto start. Uh, a few videos indicating um, the reconstruction results. In the bottom you see, the virtual LIDAR scans uh, reconstructed from these uh, depth, map, depth uh, images that you see uh, on top. On top, fortunately, they're not synchronized, but uh, uh, 3D LIDAR scans uh, always, always look great. And uh, from that here, you can actually see the accuracy of that. You might not argue um, Wolfram, but this is kind of like fake. It is um, um, like, it requires two cameras. It's actually stereo. Uh, and can you do this? And the question is like, can you do this with a single camera as well? And uh, I wouldn't post that question if the answer is yes. Um, and that was a paper presented last year at uh, CVPR. The uh, idea here is to do the very same that we saw before, but instead of going spatial from left to right image, you basically take temporal data and uh, use consecutive frames in order to do the very same that we have seen before. So we basically synthesize the, the, the frame at time t minus one from the, the frame at time t, and then calculate the proxy loss. The only difference there is that now all of a sudden we lose the scale because we don't have the baseline anymore. And in, our, in the current version, we basically do uh, have a velocity supervision loss or the opportunity to incorporate this uh, by basically uh, taking into account the uh, odometry data that we get uh, from the vehicle. And uh, here is a short video ill illustrating this on the dense depth for automated driving data set. It's actually Odaiba data. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see the images, depth image, uh, and in the bottom, you see a reconstructed LiDAR scan from, from this data. And uh, it even works in very, very challenging conditions. You later on see also uh, wet spots on the road, which are particularly hard for, for LiDAR scans, uh, for LiDARs. So this is um, very uh, promising uh, results that we obtained here. Um, yeah, here's a, there's a lot of uh, specular reflections in the camera images. Yeah, and uh, there's a few technical details about the differences. So what we don't do is here convolutions, uh, but rather uh, we use packing. And, um, and so which increases the accuracy of the entire reconstruction, but this is just a technical detail. <clears throat> what is pretty amazing is that here with, and this brings us back to the discussion about uh, self-supervised versus supervised, our approach, the self-supervised approach actually um, reaches the performance of uh, a supervised approach as well. So, um, and, and that is, it shows that this actually is, an, uh, is a promising direction to actually go and try as much as we can go for self-supervised methods rather than without the need of labeling uh, everything. Uh, and here are a few results um, on, on the kitty data set, again, with uh, high accuracy for these poles and traffic signs and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm gonna skip this here. Uh, also for transfer, for people who work in auto automated driving, uh, you can see here, for example, a few traffic cones, which are particularly challenging for 
uh, for vehicles or even defined details like this fence over here. It's nicely reconstructed uh, by this approach. Yeah. And uh, then uh, on the bottom, you see the reconstruction of um, 360 LIDARs uh, or the, the simulation of 360 LIDARs from the, uh, from the surround view images uh, of our vehicles. Good, um, so guns, uh, uh, very briefly, real-time panoptic segmentation is, uh, is a work that uh, we also published uh, last year, CVPR, and uh, it is basically on uh, the idea of, like semantic segmentation means assigning a class to every pixel, but in panoptic segmentation, you actually want to have also uh, object IDs. So you actually wanna know what the individual vehicles are and, um, and they, the challenge always is to arrive at an efficient solution that is uh, at the same time competitive. And this is the contribution of this work. And uh, just to give you an idea how this works, so we basically calculate an input image, perform semantic segmentation, calculate dense bounding boxes from this, um, query bounding boxes, <clears throat> and from those, um, we perform, we generate uh, mask assignments, and finally are able to um, calculate the individual classes or the individual objects in the, um, the segmentation. This is a network architecture uh, for those of you who are interested in how that actually uh, works. And here's a few examples on the Cityscapes data set and the Coco uh, data set where you can basically, and I intentionally mix that up over here <clears throat> to prevent you from telling which is which, but no, here is our approach. Uh, and um, you can actually see that despite being efficient, um, um, it is a regency performance of uh, existing uh, substantially more complex approaches. And uh, interesting also is like, it is kind of, current form is supervised when you, but when you go to a weaker supervision and only provide bounding boxes instead of the exact uh, instances, then you still get, arrive at, um, at a performance where that is very, very close to the, the one where you actually get the full supervised approach. So this is an alternative way of getting from like full supervision to a weak, uh, to weaker supervision that allows it to be more efficient in terms of, of labeling. Uh, and then at the end, I'm gonna briefly talk about uh, machine learning infrastructure that is required to actually obtain this. So what we observe is that, in, in, is that without ML, you are actually not going to be able to, to implement that we think about uh, envision as a self-driving car. So ML like in the nowadays plays a substantially higher role in perception, prediction and planning and maybe even control. And uh, in fact, um, when you do have this and you need to, need to be able to, to, to refine all these models over time and you need to have a dedicated approach being able with, to deal with all these, these models that they're using in, in your car. And uh, we have, for this purpose, have implemented an uh, entire like, an infrastructure for um, automated driving models, right, where we have this typical cycle of using raw data, creating from data sets from them, um, assign, uh, trying to get ground truth as much as possible and mostly in an automated fashion, um, train our networks, deploy them in the car and then also curate them based on, on raw data. So this is the typical cycle. And this is our few networks that we do have in, in the vehicle right now, like for bird's eye view, scene flow, monocular depth estimation, object detection here, traffic lights and uh, 2D object detection as well, and a few more. And um, just to, at the very end, a few words about uh, how the process works. Usually like you have like when the car comes back, you ingest you the logs that you see, then you do some sort of uh, replay with uh, human in the loop um, curation, and ever the bug is bug is locked in in in, in it, or is found in, in during driving, and you, this is often inspected manually. But you also might have automatic cur uh, cur curation by basically have implementing miners that seek for specific uh, situations in uh, in these logs. And then it is about acquiring labels, uh, the training and evaluation, and finally the, the deployment of that. Yeah. And in fact, like, so, so this is going to be log replay, uh, the individual steps, 
you look at in individual errors or failures of the vehicle, um, then um, perform labeling of scenes that might help uh, the vehicle in the future um, to perform better. Look at um, the evaluations and in, in tests in evaluation scenarios uh, so that it actually improves, perform some additional simulation testing. And once it passes, it gets back into the car. And uh, in fact, um, like that means that or while this looks fine, the problem is that there are also the dependencies <clears throat> that are expressed here on, on this slide. So for example, if you have a model that is in planning and control, then it might be actually fine if you just evaluate this model um, to actually uh, provide you the, the improvements that, uh, that you want. But if you have a more higher upstream module, like for example, in, in perception, then that might influence tracking and prediction, and they, those might influence the planning and controls modules as well. So this is something that you need to take care of as well. Like what are the downstream effects of your, your changes was the higher you are up in, in the hierarchy. And this all needs to be, uh, needs to be checked. And uh, this is what our infrastructure also um, provides tests for, for example, as to the downstream effects of changes that you do higher up in, in the, the hierarchy. So with that, I'm coming to the end. Um, so what I hoped I was able to convince you about is that um, Building truly autonomous cars actually requires both probabilistic approaches and to a lot machine learning. Um, the supervised approach actually does not scale. Uh, and uh, what we need to do is we need to go beyond supervised learning to actually be able to learn from uh, structured unlabeled data. And um, at the same time, and this is often underestimated, the uh, learning for complex systems requires proper infrastructures. And uh, that is something that uh, we are also working on. With that, I want to thank you, and uh, I'm open for questions now. Thank you, Malfran. Very nice. Uh, I am, uh, you know, I, several questions. So, so but th th this was great. Uh, and at the same time, you're sort of challenging us a little bit and sort of saying, you know, this is how you should do it. And, well, I'm, I hope the panel will, will, will get in here as well and 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 participate in, in a in you know in, in a discussion to see are we, is are we all gonna go the Toyota way or are there alternatives? Maybe I have a question was from um, so currently if you look at your entire system where is the performance bottleneck? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. See, so um, I mean, um, it's hard to it's hard to boil this down to a single number, you know. Um, some it's, it's similar with like when you write a letter about uh, a person or recommendation letter. Right? Often institutions want to have one single number, right? This guy is a four point seven, yeah? and uh, this is this is close to impossible, and. Uh, so, um, and, and depending on what your criteria are, you do also do have uh, have different bottlenecks. But from my perspective, um, you know, understanding the world is, is still one of the, the hardest problems that, that is out there. And um, also making these these predictions from from that what you see. It's basically this uh, this problem of uh, like what are, am I going to do next? So. I mean, this is, this is always interesting. So for example, if you think about a railway crossing, you know, once you are about these, with these bars going down, uh, so even we as a human driver, whenever we have to cross a railway track, uh, we ask ourselves, are we going to be able to get beyond that? And, or are we going to have to stop on the railway tracks? Uh, we have the same year, in the US with keep clear zones. Uh, whenever you enter a keep clear zone, you need to be a, you, you need to know as to whether you're going to be able to leave it. Right? And, uh, and same in Germany with intersections, you know, as soon as you enter an intersection and the traffic light is green, you need to leave, be able to leave it before the traffic light turns red. And this is even for humans an extremely difficult uh, decision. And I always get nervous because if you do this in Germany, then you might lose the your driver's license for a month if you 
are not able to manage that. So, you know, and these are the really hard decision-making processes. And um, this, I don't think that this, we are going to be able to, to program this. Uh, the only way to solve this is, is to learn. And, uh, and uh, that is basically my philosophy that all these hard tasks that are out there, uh, the only way to solve them is uh, by observing others and observing humans, how they do this and see successes and see failures and learn policies from those. And there's interesting methods out there. All these uh, offline or off policy learning approaches for this are, are very, very promising. And my belief is that there's no way uh, in, in using such type of technology for solving this problem. But you but, should ask the, but, sorry. Go ahead, Andre. You should ask one example in which uh, your system found uh, this um, uh, original solution of um, speeding up, accelerate their way out of the accident. This yeah. seems to me instead an example where you couldn't learn that from any human because no human would have ever done that just because they don't have the situation awareness. So that seems to indicate that you want some, you know, uh, non-learning based planner, at least for some situations. I did this once, I have to say. So whenever <laughs> I'm on the German highway and, uh, you know, when you are at the end of the traffic jam, I always monitor the back mirror simply because I want to know what is this guy behind me are going to do. And, and once I saw that he was way too fast. So, and, and because you can so go so fast on German highways, the lanes are extremely wide. So what I did is I took my car and drove to the very, very left of that lane. So it left space for him. And I heard him braking like crazy and he stopped next to me. And uh, so when he stopped, he raised his hand and said, thank you. And, and you know, if you observe something like that, right, put it into your, into your data set and, uh, and there you go. And then you can do this off policy learning from that as well. You can even take accidents and take them as negative examples. As long as we, and this is, I think the advantage that we are having, we are basically, you can use all the data in the vehicles and you get, for example, get accidents by just observing the bumps in your IMU, right? So that's, always like indications for something where, where things went wrong, right? And you can even monitor, oh, Baker was shut down afterwards, right? And, and things like that. So you can do active mining of such accidents and then try to use them in, in a machine learning approach to, to actually make the next car safer. So, so Wolfram, um, I hear you. At the same time, I'm sort of thinking about how much of this can we do just purely based on learning and how much do we need to sort of bring in semantics in the sense that I'm, I'm sort of like, you know, going through the, the railway crossing, it's not just the spatial layout. I really need to sort of understand yeah. what, what, you know, the, the, the semantics of this. And at the same time, I'm an adamant sort of opponent of HD maps because I just don't see HD maps as being scalable. So the question, how, how, how do you bring in this semantics in, in such a way that you can make these kinds of reasonable predictions? Yeah, yeah that's an interesting, um, that's a in very interesting question. Um, and that is also, I mean, there are limitations and uh, you're absolutely right. Um, and so, so, for example, something that we spoke about recently is this question, like, is there any way of instructing these, these vehicles for, in, for, for doing something, you know? I had a conversation recently with a colleague and uh, he told me what well, from I went on a bike ride with my son and then um, we, at some point in time like uh, I told him like you see this is the right way this person actually passed us with the vehicle and uh, so if you tell the vehicle hey this was too narrow uh, or this was too wide you know then how to how to interpret this and how to how to like turn this into action, basically. That's, an, that's a very, very difficult problem. And, and telling the vehicle, hey, you actually want to leave or you want to not stop on the railway track because the examples, the negative examples that you get is, is very, very scarce. Right. right. So, so, um, so what two of the questions that sort of came in from the audience are uh, related to, to sensing and how, how do we do the, the environment? So, so if we look at it, uh, you know, uh, Huawei, as an example, is using 5G technology 
to do very accurate localization in, in urban environments. And they claim they can get down to about five centimeter with 5G. Uh, and and so, so the question is how much of the sensing do we need to do in the car and how much could you rely on this trade-off with with sort of external sensors and yeah. and and you you talked a little bit about the infrastructure before but but the question is can you piggyback on what's going to happen anyway yeah yeah that's also a very very good question um i mean we are trying to to, to move away from uh from maps as much as we can in particular when it comes to this the guardian because guardian is something that you can put in a consumer vehicle and uh, or that is designed for consumer vehicles and there you cannot have expensive sensors and uh, i mean you cannot have like 15 cameras and four hd lidars in in these in these vehicles so at least currently not uh, and uh, so uh, and, and that means that uh, we need to be able to actually operate without hd maps and if you do that then also localization doesn't really help and, um, and there we, the only way around then is to basically understand the world as it is and, um, and directly from perception uh, that if you look at nowadays driver assistance system, the, these lane keeping assistants, they somehow do this, they localize yourself on the, on the road, but only on straight roads, you know, and maybe curvy roads, but intersections are like not handled by nowadays uh, driver assistance systems. Uh, and these are actually really, really hard problems. Uh, when you when you look at, uh, when you provide the system with an intersection or an image of an intersection uh, and have like the ability to predict how to get to this intersection, it's extremely hard and it's a an, it's an still open problem. And this is why people rely on maps. And when you have maps, then you need to have infrastructure or you use your own sensors and 5G might be a solution if uh, the chips are cheap enough um, and that might replace um, the um, these expensive localization sensors that we are using right now for uh, for the cars might be an option yes so so um some of the stuff you show and, and it's also in one of the questions from the audience is how much of this is on highways and how much of this is on urban environments and, and i know marcelo as well has been extensively testing in, in, in Singapore and traffic in Singapore is uh, an interesting challenge. So, so, so for both of you, where are you seeing this sort of evolution between highways, major roads, urban roads, uh, dirt roads? Yeah, Marcelo, do you want to go ahead? Yes, uh, in Singapore, we focus mainly on urban because uh, I think it's really uh, the last mile problem, right? Uh, centered around train stations or public transportation system. But if we can solve problems in the urban roads, I, th I think th the technologies are the same, right? Only the scenarios different, the, the uh, faster vehicles, maybe not, not as complex, uh, but faster reaction time needed, perhaps, right? So I think it's, there's, uh, um, the technologies will be uh, very applicable, right? Yeah, so in, in both scenarios, right? Um, but I have a, maybe I can use this opportunity, if I may, uh, to really comment more on the, uh, on the research direction that Full Farm briefly mentioned too, on uh, uh, localization without prior mapping, right? And really, um, it's not really that we don't have a map, uh, yeah, when you drive, right, there is always a map from Google Maps, right? Or, or even when you're indoor, there's a floor plan, right? Uh, like if, and humans do not have to do prior mapping, right? Humans can read these floor plans or Google Map plans and be able to localize uh, relative to this uh, unskilled or improper or not a LiDAR type map. Uh, I, I think this is a very important capability and uh, it will be interesting to find out uh, some, some of the directions along these areas too, yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah. I, my quick follow-up, I spoke enough. Um, the, um, I think urban driving is much more challenging um, mm -hmm. than, than highway driving. I agree with Marcelo, if he 
solved urban driving, then we are probably better uh, also, at, we can also drive on, on highways. High highways, yeah. yeah. And uh, I mean, uh, off-road is another challenge because there, uh, you know, you need to also, it's, you need to get rid of the, or you need to be able to deal with the fact that that what you identify as road is non, not necessarily flat. Right? And then having all these hidden obstacles like, like big rocks under, uh, under grass and so on. So I once went down a ski slope with a bicycle and I miserably crashed into a rock that was invisible behind the grass. Right? So it's extremely difficult. Okay, uh, let's see. So I think one I of the have. Questions. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I think uh, ahead. I have. Uh, uh, that's a very uh, nice uh, presentation. Uh, I really enjoy. Uh, I, I think one of one of the questions here is uh, if we think about autonomous driving within the next uh, 20, 30 years. Okay, how much of uh, it seems uh, in, in one of your slides, you have perception planning uh, control. Um, and it seems that uh, the control aspect is uh, the last module in the processing pipeline, right? So all the information comes from planning and perception to control. But um, uh, in situations in which you wanna be able to avoid an accident, uh, how much you think uh, there is going to be an information flow from control all the way up to perception. Is perception, is, is information processing going on in, in one direction? If we, and how, how, how do you think these systems will be architected in 20 yeah. years from now? Yeah, that's, that's, an, that's, an, uh, that's a very interesting discussion point as well. We are actually also working on um, driving beyond the limits, you know, um, um, so let's say, human capabilities so um uh, this question of like how can you for example do do automated drift so we're having joint projects with uh, with stanford in in that direction and there you actually also there you have this problem that you know a lot about the the control and but at the same time your models are not perfect and in particular in certain regimes um the, um, it is extremely hard to to model all of this and the interaction between the tire and and the road and things like that. And uh, there it is all. There's also uh, like the, a bottleneck and I think a, a way where we could an opportunity for using this combination of classical control and perception, right? understanding what is going on with the vehicle and what is the controller currently doing and how can we help. Uh, a step in and how do we need to change the control in order to achieve the, the goals of, of the vehicle. Right? And so, for example, like catching a vehicle that is sliding on, on ice, right? that is something that is uh, extremely challenging. And uh, um, yeah, and there, I think uh, this, you can even have the direct connection between control and uh, uh, perception plus machine learning, uh, because in the end, uh, it's gonna be difficult to do this all uh, based on, on, on models. And, and but it seems that for urban driving, or even if you want to avoid accidents, it seems that uh, uh, the controller is just the controller slash, slash planner. And I guess uh, here, I, I want to bring into the discussion the idea of replanning. Yeah. Uh, 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 so it seems that for uh, urban driving or for the cases of trying to avoid a accident, uh, it seems that uh, the replanning aspect or the control aspect is just the last module, which only consumes information for the perception side. Yeah. That's basically uh, your view uh, for, for the case of uh, urban driving. Or yeah. the case where you want to, even if you want to avoid an, an accident in an urban environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree that, um, but I think that it's not going to be sufficient, right? So um, like in the long run, it might be like, for example, there is like, we are also operating in an arbor and there the vehicles might even go on snow and uh, 
you know, and then you need to understand also like the, the or to, to adapt your models and being able to, to predict uh, what is going to happen if I issue a specific control command. And uh, for that, I mean, I think control and, um, and, and perception actually should also like reiterate and refine these models over time. You know, I, I don't, I agree with this architecture that I showed is, is a very common architecture, but I don't think that it is the optimal one in all cases. Does this answer your question? But I would love to, love to talk to you about this as well later. So we have one or two questions left. We have to be respectful of people's time as well. So, so Tamim is asking the question, you know, um, of the, if we look at the example of what was happening on the highway, the question is interpreting others' behavior. How far are we and, and how far do you think we can get in terms of interpreting other people's behavior? It's a partially observable problem in many respects. Yeah, yeah that's, that's true. And this is actually one of the key challenges. And um, this architecture, for example, also shows a shortcoming in, in, in this question of interacting between um, the interaction between ego and ADO uh, agents, you know? So one problem that Tommy is uh, addressing is like, how well are you able to predict what is going on? And I mean, people think about five to 10 seconds typically, right? What is going to happen in five to 10 seconds? It's extremely hard to, to, to make prediction as to whether a, a person standing on the sidewalk is actually uh, willing to, to enter the road. Right? And or will enter the road. These are things that are uh, extremely hard to predict. If you're too conservative, and you're going to just going to stop, right? And if you're too optimistic, then you might have a fatal accident. And getting this correct is extremely uh, complicated. But it can get even worse because sometimes, and you know, by by slowing down in order to um, to actually give the vehicle time to, to, uh, um, to reason or to actually um, minimize the risk, you know, in case of the, of, because of the uncertainty that might indicate to the pedestrian that it is fine to cross. And then they all of a sudden have these weird interactions that by your behavior that is actually conservative, you enforce people or you, you indicate to people that it is fine to, to cross it. So that similar is this, lane change in heavy traffic where we sometimes aggressively nudge a little bit to the left uh, in order to indicate, hey, I want to get in. I mean, in, in Rome or so, you just go, right? But um, in, in, in other countries, you're a little bit more, more careful. Right? David? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, I wanted to add a question about uh, in regards to end-to-end -end models currently that are being explored at least with the current tools that we have. Um, so what are your thoughts on uh, on really some of those re recent developments, whether it's uh, supervised or RL, uh, and the way they're really treating future spaces to learn really uh, an, an action all the way at end to end? Um, it almost makes it hard to really decouple things that are uh, like such as traffic rules, regulations, uh, vehicle specific uh, configurations, sensors, uh, so if going back to your point about change anything, change everything, uh, how would you think that this could, could be accounted for, for end-to-end -end models on, and whether that would be possible? Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I mean, I tend to say that end-to-end uh, -end models are more like academic questions. And uh, but when you really think, um, I, I'm a big fan of utilizing the knowledge that we are having in, in, in the models that we know uh, and in building upon these models, well knowing that every model is wrong, you know, um, so it never accurately reflects the world. But I think this is where the strength is of, of the machine learning approach to basically capture the difference between the, 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 the model assumptions and that what is actually going on in the real world. And uh, this is where uh, the, the strength of these particular deep learning approaches are that you can actually do the, the deal with the the difference between the ideal model, like the bicycle model, and the actual behavior of, of the vehicle on, on the road. And uh, I think 
for the time being, we are going to be uh, like better um, with that. Uh, although there is a proof that uh, a single net neural network or millions of neural networks can do this in an end-to-end -end fashion, and those guys even walk on two legs, you know. Um, but uh, I think that's if we try to get there, that's fine, and it's an academic solution. But for the time being. Building, if you really want to build real robots for the real world right now, then uh, we probably have to deal with some mixture there. So, two of the questions we have from the audience is sort of related to um, driving not only, you know, it's going to take a long time until we get to fully autonomous vehicle and we only have autonomous vehicles on the road. How, you know, the, the mixture of human drivers and autonomous vehicles and modeling sort of the cognitive behavior of, of people around you. Where, where, where do you see we are in this? Yeah, that's also very interesting. So um, yeah, I keep having the, these discussions also with others like from, from other companies. It's not that we do and don't talk uh, to each other. Uh, it is actually extremely expensive to, to, to adjust a vehicle to a specific environment. Right? So for example, if you would say, hey, that the vehicles that have been programmed for Mountain View, California, and you just like ship them to, uh, to Singapore, and all of a sudden they're going to work nicely there. That's, that's an illusion. You know? <laughs> uh, people behave differently on the road and um, you need to accommodate to, to the driving behavior of the people in the culture uh, in the individual countries. And I, from my perspective, the only way of doing this is again, uh, machine learning, observing how people drive and uh, using, like I call this a data-driven approach, basically track the traffic, track what's going on, how people behave and adjust your parameters according to that. And, create a model that you can easily adjust to different environments and different steps. Okay, any last questions from the panel before we wrap it up? The last question yeah. I have. Yes, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so how much industry should fund fundamental research in ML? And I'm talking about autonomous driving industry. And I'm talking about foundational research in, let's say, um, uh, deep learning, for example. You know, I mean, uh, everybody's using deep learning at this point, and that's great. Um, but how much of uh, uh, funding uh, should be, or, or how much, uh, autonomous driving companies should focus on fundamental research on the deep learning side. Yeah, so my, um, and I keep advocating this as well. There's right now plenty of articles about exactly this question. The, the problem that uh, like with Apple coming out with, a, with its own car um, in, the, in the near future, with auto, auto, autonomous driving capabilities, um, so the expectation is that this people will have just an amazing experience in the car as well, you know, on top of the functionalities that are there. And uh, if you look at what these companies have been doing in the past, is basically utilizing user data to, uh, to build better interfaces to, to, to interact with people. And, um, and I think this is what what we are going to observe, and that's what, that's what the OEMs, the car or manufacturers are afraid of. Right? So and the only solution towards this is, is, is going in that direction as well, and going more uh, machine learning oriented, and uh, like permanently asking yourself, how can I actually utilize the way people use our cars, uh, and the data about the, the, the people in our cars, and how they drive, and what they do in order to build better cars in the future. So I think they should, the only way to, to keep up with this is substantially invest into to machine learning and in processes infrastructure to actually uh, being able to, to keep up with these recent developments. And then on top of that, uh, like uh, 
build better cars for the future and safer cars. Okay. Thank you, Wolfram. That was great. Uh, if you stop sharing, I just want to put up a slide for yeah. to announce where uh, the next one is going to be. Uh, so the uh, that was great. For thank you to the panel. Thank you to um, to Wolfram for for great talk, uh, great discussion. Uh, our next IFR colloquium will be on soft robotics. It will be March 18th, uh, 2021 at 4 p.m. East European time. Uh, so uh, we're very much looking forward to seeing you then. And uh, thank you for joining us today. That was uh, really great. Now I just have to figure out how I can stop sharing them. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. and. Thanks for the great discussion. Thank you. Bye-bye.